Greetings YouTubers and welcome to episode 3 of Lies Flurfs Tell. Today we're going to be considering the flat earth lie, sea level is flat. Contrary to popular perception, the study of sea level is actually extremely complicated and we're going to have to introduce some concepts that most people will never have heard of. We're going to start with the concept of the geoid. The geoid is the equipotential surface that coincides with mean ocean surface height. This is the shape that the ocean surface would adopt if it was subject only to gravitational and rotational effects. In other words, we're excluding here tidal effects, currents and winds. I've already omitted some of the more technical details because some rotational effects are tides, but we'll skip over that. Here is a schematic diagram showing the relationship between geoid height and the reference ellipsoid. The significance of the geoid is that any object moving under the influence of gravity moves perpendicular to the equipotential surface at that point. We can therefore map the geoid by precisely observing gravitational effects. This has been done by extended observational campaigns including ground-based gravity stations and airborne, shipborne and satellite-based gravimetric observations. Obviously, for airborne and shipborne observations, the motion of the vessel needs to be compensated for. This requires purpose-built instruments with integrated environmental controls and gyro stabilization. There are a wide variety of commercially available models, some of which I am showing here. In an actual observation campaign, these instruments are placed in appropriate craft and then transported along carefully selected paths. The first global geoid map was produced by the Russians in 1952, but this effort only achieved a spatial resolution of about 500 kilometers. Since the 1970s, these more traditional forms of gravity observation have been supplemented by satellite observations. In their most basic form, the satellites are simple spheres covered by retroreflectors. Tracking the motion of the satellites using ground-based laser stations allows us to reconstruct the gravitational influence on the satellites through their path. The next increment in sophistication was the CHAMP mission, which incorporated both retroreflectors and onboard accelerometers, which were used to remove any non-gravitational influence on the craft. Increasing in sophistication again, we have the GOCHE mission, which used onboard gravity gradiometers to measure Earth's gravitational field. But the current state of the art in satellite gravimetry are the GRACE and GRACE follow-on missions. In both missions, twin satellites are deployed one behind the other, each following the same orbital path. The mean separation between the craft is 220 kilometers, but variations in this inter-satellite distance are precisely measured and used to reconstruct gravitational influences. As the satellites approach a mass concentration on or within the Earth, the lead satellite is more strongly affected by its gravitational influence and accelerates away from the following craft. The intersatellite range thus increases. Once the lead satellite is past the mass concentration, the mass concentration decelerates the satellite. Meanwhile, the following satellite is still accelerating and catches up so that the intersatellite range is decreasing. Once both satellites are past the mass concentration, the following satellite is more strongly affected by it and more greatly decelerated. Thus, the intersatellite range increases again. The resulting variations in intersatellite distance are measured using high precision laser ranging techniques that are accurate to within one micron. As with most near Earth satellite missions, the positions of the craft are recorded via onboard GPS receivers. Careful analysis of the intersatellite range data allows us to reconstruct Earth's gravitational field, and combining it with all the other data allows us to reconstruct the geoid with a spatial resolution of about 10 kilometers and a vertical accuracy of about 2 centimeters. The results of our analysis demonstrate that the geoid is generally within 100 meters of the reference ellipsoid, but that there are significant variations in geoid height. In other words, the equipotential surface coinciding with mean sea level is not flat. Beyond direct measurements of Earth's gravitational field, there is another data set we can use to constrain mean sea surface height, and that is satellite altimetry. As I discussed in the first episode of this series, satellite altimetry works by broadcasting a time-encoded radio signal down to the surface and seeing how long it takes to return to the craft. This schematic diagram illustrates some of the complexities involved in this analysis, showing the distinction between instantaneous sea surface height, mean sea surface height, and the geoid. The diagram also shows two independent observational data sets that we can use to validate the altimetry results, those being tide gauge readings and satellite navigation system data. There is a very broad range of techniques available for recording sea surface height at tide gauges. 
Older techniques include simple measuring sticks or float-based systems, while more modern tide gauge stations use pressure sensors or ultrasound or radio waves to detect ocean surface height. Whichever technique is used, an array of supplementary data must also be collected. Wind strength and direction, air and water temperature, and any vertical land motion of the tide gauge itself, which is detected and corrected for using GNSS data. In this figure, we see an intercomparison between satellite altimetry data, shown as crosses or triangles, against water level gauge data, which is shown as a solid line, for Lake Superior. We can immediately see that the agreement between the two data sets is extremely good, with a weighted RMS difference of less than 2.5 centimeters. The other technique we can use to validate satellite altimetry data is placing GNSS receivers on research vessels or buoys. We can then compare the position of the GNSS receiver against the position inferred using the altimetry data. Here we see just such an intercomparison, which shows that the two data sets agree to within 20 centimeters at most, and are generally much closer than that. We can therefore confirm, using two independent tests, that sea surface height inferred from altimetry is accurate when compared with tide gauge data and GNSS data. We can use the altimetry data to create a global map of mean sea surface height, which is shown here. Again, we see that mean sea surface height cleaves reasonably closely to the reference ellipsoid, but we again see significant deviations of the order of 100 meters. Again confirming the result, sea level is not flat. Even flat earthers should be able to recognize the similarity between the geoid and mean sea surface height, but these two quantities are not in fact the same. Winds and currents produce systematic differences between the two that are known as the mean dynamic topography, or more correctly, the mean dynamic ocean topography. The magnitude of this effect is everywhere less than 1.5 meters, so much smaller than the undulations in the geoid. Nonetheless, its mere existence confirms the fact sea level is not flat. Many of you may have noticed the fact that the geoid drops more than 100 meters below the reference ellipsoid just south of India, but that the geoid rises by more than 50 meters as you move northwest or northeast along the Indian coast. I wanted to bring particular attention to this feature because not only does it demonstrate emphatically that sea level is not flat, but its existence was inferred many decades before we had instruments accurate enough to map the geoid. John Pratt, in his analysis of the great trigonometrical survey data, was able to infer the difference in sea level between Karachi and Cape Cormoran. In his calculations, he overestimated how large this difference was, but that he was able to determine that it would be significant at all is nonetheless impressive, especially given the limitations on both the data and the computational resources available to him. Okay, so that's where I might call it for today. Just to recap what I've covered, Today I introduced the concept of the geoid, which is the equipotential surface corresponding with mean sea level. This is the geometry that the sea surface would adopt in the absence of dynamic forcing. This surface has been mapped with a vertical accuracy of 2 cm and a spatial resolution of 10 km. This has been achieved through an ongoing observational campaign that combines ground-based, airborne, shipborne, and satellite-based gravimetric measurements. The geoid is observed to deviate from the reference ellipsoid by as much as 100 meters in some instances, demonstrating that sea level is emphatically not flat. This result is confirmed by satellite altimetry of mean sea surface height, which is in turn validated by GNSS observations and by tide gauge data. So if you ever hear a flat earther making the absurd claim that sea level is flat, you will instantly recognize that this is nothing more than the demented rambling of a lunatic who has lost all connection with observable reality. To be fair, you probably realize that already, but it's nice to have data backing up your intuition. Okay, that does it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you'll join me next time when I'll be discussing the next Flirth lie, Einstein superseded Newton.